Welcome back to another episode of the Stronger by Science podcast. To begin today's episode, we've got some feats of strength, and we discuss two brand new articles that have recently gone up on the Stronger by Science website. One article discusses everything lifters would want to know about antioxidants, and the other discusses which factors influence injury risk in power lifters. After that, we discuss some research about muscle protein synthesis and links between artificial sweeteners and stroke risk, followed by some Q&A questions. In today's episode, we also debut a brand new segment called On The Rise, in which we showcase up-and-coming creators of fitness content that are worth a follow. Finally, to close out the show, Greg shares some cooking-related information, then I totally upstage and outshine him with my spicy chicken recipe. As always, thank you for listening, and enjoy the show. Welcome back to the Stronger by Science podcast. This is your host, Eric Trexler, and today I have a special guest, temporary host, named Greg Knuckles. Greg, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thanks for the invite. I am uh, I am tickled and delighted to join you today. Awesome. Just stick to the script. You know, Be natural and everything should be fine. Um, so this episode is going to air two days before Leap Day, and I know many of you program your training two, three, four years in advance. If you didn't account for this extra day in the calendar year, that means trouble. But fortunately, Greg... You mentioned something about a quarterly programming thing coming up that might be of interest to our listeners. Uh, Yeah, so after the Leap Day completely throws off your program, uh, on March 1st, you can get back on the wagon. Um, So a subreddit that I frequent, Our Weight Room, does uh, what they call program parties every so often. I can't remember if they're quarterly or bi-yearly. It's one of the two. But anyway, uh, there is a new one kicking off March 1st, and the program that was selected is Average to Savage 2.0. So if you are interested in running that program, it's it's been in beta for about a year. Um, I was done. (laughs) I was done collecting all of the feedback I needed, maybe like six months ago and and I've just been lazy about finishing it up. Uh, but it will be finalized by March 1st. Um, so if you would like to do that with a bunch of like-minded, uh, folks who are interested in strength, consider joining the R weight room program party. One quick clarification before we move on that start date of March 1st for the Reddit weight room program party, that is a hard cutoff. So uh, I'm going to put a link in the uh, the description or the episode notes here. If you've signed up for the program party using that link by March 1st, you'll you'll automatically be added to the Average to Savage subreddit, and you'll get access to the program. Um, otherwise, you'll have to wait until that program goes on sale on our website, StrongerByScience.com, um, which should be relatively soon. Um, I tell you what, we've got... Is it one feet of strength or two here? We got two coming up? Well, it's two, um, but I also have another thing I'd like to start the show with. Okay. Um, It is today, I believe, everybody's favorite holiday. So we're recording this on, uh, oh no, yeah, yeah, okay, I'm looking at the right day. We're recording this on February 21st, and today is, as we all know, National Sticky Bun Day. So, uh, if you forgot to celebrate on the 21st, you're listening to this when it came out, uh, go out and get a sticky bun. They're nice. You know, as a true patriot, I usually turn President's Day into a week-long thing, so I don't know if I can fit two holidays into the mix. But but for those who observe, you know, sticky bun day sounds great. What are some of your favorite President's Day traditions? Uh, the family gets around. We read the Constitution, um, take turns going through it. There's all sorts of stuff. It, it's good. What's your favorite amendment? Oh, I, I couldn't even pick. There's so many. Honestly, I'm not a fan of the amendments. I think they got it right the first time. <laughs> and uh, honestly, supporting any of the amendments is just trampling on the uh, immortal wisdom of the framers. Okay. Uh, well, that's sarcastic um, for sure. Let's go ahead and move on. I don't I don't want the constitutionalists to come after us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so constitutional scholars, that was just a joke. Uh, let's get to the feats of strength. All right, so uh, we just have two this time around. If you'll remember last episode, there were uh, approximately a shit ton. 
Um, but I guess people have just decided to not be as strong for the past couple of weeks. But the two that we have are super, super cool and very impressive, which will hopefully make up for it somewhat. Uh, so I saw some people sharing a video around of a uh, fairly small woman deadlifting big weights. And I saw it and said, wow, she's quite strong. And then I looked into who it was and it became just batshit crazy very quickly. Allow me to explain. So uh, the lifter's name is Samantha Eugenie. She deadlifted 210 at 63 or in freedom units, 463 at 139. Uh, Lift looked very good. It was very smooth. Um, She wasn't wearing straps. So, you know, it it looked to be a deadlift up to competition standard. Uh, It was a gym lift. And that in and of itself is a very, very impressive deadlift in that weight class. I think it's I think it would be top 10 or like borderline top 10. Uh, The world record in that weight class is 262 or 498 uh, pounds by Samantha Calhoun. So, you know, it's it's like fairly close to the world record. And I was like, oh, that's pretty strong. And then I started reading comments and people were like, oh, I can't believe she's only 17. And that's when I said, what the fuck's going on right now? Um, So potential blind spot for me. I don't follow teenage powerlifting closely at all, and I especially don't really follow female teenage powerlifting at all. Um, That probably makes me a bad person. So I had to go on open powerlifting and check, like, just how bonkers is that deadlift for a 17-year-old girl? Uh, And it turns out it's pretty fucking bonkers. Uh, She already has, uh, Samantha Eugenie already has the world record in the 16 and 17 year old age division. Uh, At her last meet, she pulled 190 kilos, which is 418 pounds. And the next closest person to her in that age and weight division uh, pulls 173 or 381. And so like, I'm not trying to poo poo that at all. Uh, Yeah, a 17 year old regardless of size and sex pulling close to four plates is impressive um you know a 140 pound girl pulling close to four plates is impressive but samantha eugenie pulling you know 463 that's bonkers um so we very well may have the next uh the next deadlift prodigy on our hands uh which is pretty cool so props to her super super impressive Um, the second one, also a a young female lifter, but this one is like objectively more bonkers. Um, so it's someone we've talked about on the show before, Mahalia Reeves. Uh, she benched 375, uh, at, in the super heavyweight division. I think her prior record, uh, was either 365 or 370, um, But yeah, so she went 375, and the reason that's bonkers is that moves her into sixth place all time uh, for all female benchers, including untested, which is is wild. Um, So I mean, like, steroids obviously help people of both sexes get strong, but seem to have a a proportionally larger effect for for females than males. But so, you know, comfortably in the top 10 all time there. And it is the number two tested female bench of all time behind only Roberta Collins, who did, I think, 390 or 391 all the way back in 2003. So, you know, it's the biggest number uh, any any woman has hit um, in the past 18 years. She's still improving. She's only 16 years old. Um, So, I mean, it's hard for me to put into words how ludicrously impressive that is. Um, You know, when you think sports where athletes are in the top two, two in the world ever at 16 years old, the list is essentially like gymnastics <laughs> and that's it. Uh, that doesn't generally apply to powerlifting. And generally, if it does apply to powerlifting, it's going to be in some of the lighter weight classes, like generally uh, heavyweights peak a little bit later in their careers. So 
number two tested bench all time in the super heavyweight division at 16 years old. And like it's 375, like regardless of any of that, like that's a that's not a bad bench for anyone. Uh, And the fact that it's a 16 year old girl fucking crazy. Um, So anyway, super, super impressive. Yeah, that's crazy. All right. So we've talked in the past. We used to do the podcast every week. We switched to every other week. We said we were going to write more. We've got two new articles up on the website that have gone up in the last couple weeks. Um, In the past, we've used the podcast to kind of talk about some of the articles that have gone up after we have a chance to uh, get some feedback on them, see how people react to them. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the article I recently posted on the site about antioxidants, and you're going to talk about our recent article uh, on injury rates in lifters. So antioxidants, uh, if you're a longtime listener of the podcast, we've talked about them before, and I kept basically saying I'm going to reserve my uh, opinion until after I've had a chance to really dig through the literature and finish my article. So now is the time. And the reason that this really came up, the reason we wanted to uh, put out some content about antioxidants is it's really, really commonly accepted in the lifting world that antioxidant supplements will blunt hypertrophy. And you hear people say it all the time. And, and I mean, we've said it, you know, because there is some degree of evidence uh, supporting that. But what we wanted to do is basically evaluate that literature closely and say, how much of how big of a deal is it to have high dose antioxidants when it comes to strength adaptations or more specifically hypertrophy adaptations to resistance training? Um, now, with the antioxidant literature, I feel like in the fitness world, you see antioxidants get talked about a lot, but usually very, very vaguely. And I couldn't find a lot of good, accessible um, articles that really just kind of gave a baseline rundown of what people need to know about antioxidants. So my hope for this article is whether or not you're interested in the super applied stuff about hypertrophy, at the very least, the beginning half of the article is just like, let's figure out what the terminology is because a lot of times people use these terms vaguely or interchangeably when they probably shouldn't be using them that way. So the first thing to to get out of the way with antioxidants, getting through this literature is messy. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, you know, so for example, fla- uh, flavonoids, there are over 4,000 known distinct types of flavonoids. And that's just one class of polyphenols. And polyphenols are just one class of non enzymatic antioxidants. So when you start with the vague term antioxidant, you start breaking it into subgroups and subgroups of those subgroups and so on down the line. We're talking about thousands and thousands of distinct compounds. So that's one of the things that's frustrating when you try to dive into this literature is, I mean, what do you even search for? Do you search for vitamin C or polyphenols or a specific polyphenol? Uh, You really have to cast a broad net when you try to summarize this stuff. So what I don't want to do is essentially read the article, (laughs) like paraphrase it section by section here because that's not particularly uh, fascinating to listen to. I do encourage you to check out the article, strongerbyscience.com slash antioxidants. But just to give you an idea of what you're getting into, if you were to go to that article, the first half just clears up a bunch of terminology about antioxidants that you may have heard before. But like I said, a lot of times people kind of tiptoe around the language and use it very vaguely because you have to really get into the details if you're trying to elucidate exactly what these terms mean and how they relate to each other. So I talk a little bit about what an antioxidant is, what it does, um, talked a little bit about why it's important to manage oxidative stress. Um, so, um, you know, we, we create, when we, when we begin exercise, for example, we start to generate reactive species, which is kind of an umbrella term that refers to uh, free radicals, reactive oxygen species, reactive nitrogen species. So in the article, I just say, let's group those together. We're going to call them reactive species. And when we engage in exercise, oxidative stress and the production of these different reactive species does go up. And uh, if, if we were to completely blunt the production of reactive species, muscle contractility would be reduced. So we want there to be some kind of increase in reactive species production when we exercise, but 
too much production of react- reactive species is equally problematic. So elevated levels of reactive species can damage uh, all sorts of proteins throughout the body and are also associated with fatigue during exercise. So we want to manage reactive species. Um, we want there to be sufficient production, but not excessive production. And where antioxidants come into play is they, uh, they mitigate uh, some of the effects of reactive species production. They can attenuate their production. They can scavenge them after they're produced. Um, so that, or they can affect enzymes that then work to eventually scavenge them uh, through endogenous processes. So can I drop a very random fun fact in here right now? Absolutely. So uh, you mentioned that high levels of, of reactive species production can damage proteins, damage DNA. Um, well, I don't think you mentioned DNA, but that's another it's thing true. it can yeah. do. Um, and just you know, just generally negatively impact various cell structures. So uh, this is related, as you'll see in a second, but that partially explains why birds live so long. So here's the fun fact. Uh, If you plot metabolic rate versus um, lifespan on a log-log graph, you can just draw a straight line through it like it's a a pretty well-described three-quarters power exponential relationship. Um, And it is it it seems to have a fair amount to do with mitochondrial capacity um, and thus uh, like oxidative stress resulting from free radical production. And so essentially like when things have faster metabolisms like they're they're producing more reactive species they accumulate more cell damage they age faster they die faster there's more to it than that but that seems to be like one of the major driving factors cool thing about birds is they can fly a lot of people don't know that but that is a defining characteristic of birds uh and fun fact about flight is it is unbelievably energy intensive um like it takes I don't know, this is probably wrong, but it's probably in about the right ballpark. It takes like 20 times more energy to fly than it does to run. Um, Like it's a huge, huge difference. And so as we all know, mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell. Uh, And for a bird to be able to fly, it needs just an absolutely enormous amount of mitochondria in all of the muscles that relate to flight. Um, And so because of that, they have an insanely high oxidative capacity. And also because of that, they have uh, substantially lower free radical production than other animals of similar size with similar metabolic rates. And so like, for example, humans are, I think, the biggest outlier when it comes to lifespan. Like most things that are approximately our size live like eh, maybe like 20, 30 years, give or take. Um, but you know, that's like pretty long lived for an animal. Um, like elephants live longer, some reptiles live super long. Um, but basically like once you start getting down into like the 20, 30 pound range, um, you know, then you're talking about dogs and stuff lives 10, 15 years, maybe 20 if you're super lucky, but like kind of in the 10 to 15 year range. Whereas if you have a bird that size, it might be living 30, 40, 50, even 60 years. Um, Some albatrosses have been known to live for like 70, 80 years plus. Um, And even like smaller birds, which are like comparable in size to mice, which don't live long at all, um, can live, you know, 10, 20 years. And so one of the reasons for that is they have so many mitochondria um, that just like day to day energy production produces far fewer free radicals. And so they age at a much, much slower rate. Um, and that is not the only reason, but probably the biggest reason why birds are like it, as an entire class of creatures, um, way, way longer lived than one would anticipate them to be given their size and metabolic rate. Well, there you go. Fun fact about birds. So, Getting back to <laughs> antioxidant supplementation. I just think that's really cool. No, it is cool. It's very cool. Well, isn't that from that book? Yeah, so I, I've recommended this book probably four times on the podcast already. 
but Power, Sex, Suicide, Mitochondria, and the Meaning of Life. It's an entire book about mitochondria. And I know you're thinking, God, that sounds so cool. I promise you it's at least twice as cool as you think it is. Uh, yeah. It's by Nick Lane, and I would strongly, strongly recommend it. I still need to get around to reading that, I will admit. It's really good. So in this article, like I mentioned, the the management of total oxidative stress, you know, the production of reactive species, and then the um, the neutralization of reactive species, it's really important for us to keep those things regulated within a certain workable range. Um, now we have endogenous systems that do that, but obviously it's also impacted by our dietary intake of antioxidants. And so that, that's kind of what the, the first half of the article is basically saying, what are reactive species? How do they relate to our performance and health and how do dietary antioxidants fit into that picture? Um, so if you ever hear somebody saying a bunch of stuff about antioxidants, that seems weird. Just go to this article, read the first half see if it fits in, if it kind of fits into that narrative. If not, it's possible that they're a little bit off base or might have uh, some information a little bit mixed up there. After that, I get into some of the more practical aspects of uh, antioxidant intake and supplementation. I look at some of the effects on blood flow, acute performance, which mostly currently the literature looks at endurance type outcomes uh, for exercise. Um, I look a little bit at the effects on recovery. Obviously, I don't want to go and point by point recap everything in the article, but the general takeaways are that there is some good evidence to suggest that various antioxidant supplements can promote blood flow during exercise. Things like grape juice, um, pomegranate extract, uh, cocoa supplementation, those things, there is some evidence suggesting that they do promote blood flow during exercise. Um, which could be a beneficial thing for performance and theoretically recovery as well. Um, then I talk a little bit about uh, acute performance. Like I said, the performance data, it's fine. Like I said, most of it's looking at endurance type activities. There is some good evidence for things like beetroot juice, which have a lot of antioxidants, uh, grape extract. Um, but really the beetroot juice literature, it's a little bit, it's hard to lump it in as an antioxidant supplement because it's really a nitrate supplement that happens to have antioxidants. So when you look at the effects on blood flow, those are, those make a lot of sense because antioxidants reduce the conversion of nitric oxide to peroxynitrite and essentially extend or increase the bioavailability of nitric oxide, which promotes blood flow. So with the blood flow, those are very intuitive results that we see a modest but noticeable uh, enhancement of exercise blood flow. The acute performance data essentially, like I said, when we have, have thousands and thousands of different compounds, it's hard to put a singular summary statement on the literature. But generally speaking, it's neutral to slightly positive uh, for many of the compounds. There are certainly several uh, for which there are really no tangible benefits, but there are a few different antioxidant-based supplements that have been shown to enhance various types of performance. I wouldn't hang my hat on antioxidants as an acute performance-boosting supplement strategy, but there might be something there for some of these supplements and if you want to look into some of the details about which ones seem to work, which ones don't, like I said, you can always uh, head over to the article and check it out. Um, I look, looked at a little bit of the recovery literature. There are some studies with things like pomegranate juice and watermelon juice showing uh, enhanced recovery from uh, intense or exhaustive exercise. Same thing with tart cherry juice. So that evidence looks a little bit better than the acute performance data. Um, there, there are things looking at various uh, metrics related to oxidative stress, inflammation, even just the recovery of force production and soreness after exercise, where some of those more plant-based antioxidant juices and extracts do seem to have some positive effects. But the thing we really wanted to talk about in this uh, particular article was training adaptations. And like I said, the, the thing that really got this got us going on this topic was a recent meta-analysis that was looking at um, the effects of vitamin C and E supplementation on strength and hypertrophy outcomes in response to training. Um, now, one of the reasons people are really open to this idea uh, that antioxidant supplements blunt hypertrophy, there are uh, multiple studies showing that high-dose antioxidant supplementation uh 
reduces the activity of certain anabolic signaling pathways related to hypertrophy. So it's a very intuitive st- extension logically that if you're reducing the activity of these hypertrophy promoting pathways, you're probably going to be blunting hypertrophy. But we really shouldn't always assume that to be the case. Um, and so like, for example, if you look at the endurance training literature with antioxidants, um, we see uh, several studies showing that uh, antioxidant supplementation interferes with signaling pathways related to mitochondrial biogenesis, uh, which is a, a big time adaptation when it comes to uh, in endurance capacity in response to training. However, despite that, most of the studies looking at the effects on actual endurance capacity and performance and endurance activities, it doesn't seem quite as bleak as the signaling outcomes would indicate. So it's it's actually kind of a mixed bag. The signaling stuff looks really bad for endurance adaptations, but when you actually look at VO2 max, time to exhaustion, uh, the, the idea of blunted training adaptations really isn't as pronounced as you would expect them to be. When it comes to resistance training stuff, like I mentioned, there was that meta-analysis by Clifford and colleagues, uh, and we'll link that in the show notes. Uh, when it comes to strength outcomes, I really didn't look into them that much because uh, it, it's hard to think of a mechanism by which antioxidant supplementation would blunt strength performance aside from by blunting hypertrophy. You would think if there's going to be some effect on strength, it's going to be essentially by reducing hypertrophy and, and having more of a long-term effect. Um, and what what they found, they did do that in their meta-analysis. And the result uh, for high-dose vitamin C and E supplementation when it came to strength outcomes It was a non-significant finding, but if anything, it was actually a very small effect favoring the antioxidant groups rather than the placebo groups. So there's really no meat on the bone there to really probe further and try to figure out if if there's some kind of link by which high-dose antioxidants would blunt strength outcomes. With the hypertrophy outcomes, the meta-analysis did find uh, essentially no significant effect in either direction. And what I do in the article is I dig into a few of the key studies uh, to really consider there. These are studies that took um, direct measures of various hypertrophy outcomes, looking either at the level of like a muscle fiber or looking at um, muscle size using MRI or ultrasound, something like that. Basically anything other than just a global measure of like, you know, DEXA fat-free mass, looking at more specific, more localized indices of hypertrophy. There were some select variables within these studies that, you know, the uh, the placebo group outperformed the antioxidant group in terms of the, the magnitude of hypertrophy obtained. But the effects that were noted in these studies were pretty modest in magnitude, and more importantly, quite inconsistent. So my gut reaction, just based on how people talk about this topic in the fitness industry, was that, okay, well, you know, I'm sure there's going to be a pretty consistent, fairly notable blunting of hypertrophy in response to these high-dose antioxidant interventions. And in, in reality, that doesn't seem to be the case. If there is an effect, it seems to be pretty inconsistent and not particularly large in magnitude. No, I, I thought the exact same thing. I thought not necessarily that it was a completely closed case, but that like either at minimum, um, you know, there were studies that, that mostly kind of indicated that uh, high dose antioxidants might have a negative effect on hypertrophy or, you know, maybe it was a case where like there's two studies and they both said antioxidants aren't good. But maybe we didn't have a consensus because there wasn't that much research. And there's not a ton of research. Um, but, you know, there, there is enough to consider it a body of literature, I'd say. Uh, and I very much felt the same way as you. Like, it, it, was, uh, it was way, way more inconsistent than I believed it to be. Because people do talk about it as if it's just a known fact that high-dose antioxidants blend hypertrophy. Yeah. And one of the fascinating things that that I found as I continued to kind of dig into this literature is there's a great review by uh, Ishmael et al. And they they talk about the evidence that basically indicating that the effects of vitamin C and E might be distinct from the effects we see from other kind of plant-derived phytonutrient 
antioxidants. So when we look at like various types of polyphenol sources, what they indicated was, you know, if you give someone a really high dose of vitamin C, they're going to have a big increase in, in, you know, plasma levels of vitamin C. It's a pretty straightforward mechanism by which you take vitamin C, it goes up in the blood, it directly scavenges reactive species. And that's a, a, a pretty open and shut case in terms of what's going on there. And so what they, what they suggest is basically if you're a person that doesn't have excessive uh, oxidative stress and excessive levels of reactive species in your blood, you know, if you're a healthy, fit individual uh, who doesn't have some kind of clinical outcome that uh, increases oxidative stress, there's probably no benefit and potentially some downsides to really high dose vitamin C supplementation. However, if you do have some kind of clinical condition or if you're an older person who tends to have older people tend to have higher levels of oxidative stress beyond a certain age, then it might actually be a beneficial thing. But what's really interesting is that they were talking about polyphenols specifically as one category of these different kind of plant-based phytonutrient antioxidants. And, you know, when, when we take polyphenols, it's unlikely that we're going to have some huge increase in plasma polyphenol concentrations in response to that. More likely, what what they rec- or what they suggest is going on is that when you take polyphenols or some other kind of uh, phytonutrient antioxidant, those are probably activating uh, NRF two, and that is having kind of secondary antioxidant effects. So. You're activating NRF2, which is then increasing the activation of endogenous antioxidant enzymes. So it, it actually, what, what they propose is the effects uh, for vitamin C and E when it comes to hypertrophy, there might be some degree of blunting. It's like I said, it's not large and it's not particularly consistent. But what's interesting is that the the evidence pertaining to polyphenols and other phytonutrients, um, you really don't see any evidence at all related to the blunting of hypertrophy, and they suspect that there are some distinct mechanisms that would describe why there is potentially some divergent outcomes. So if you want to get down into the details about this whole body of literature, I do encourage you to check out the article. In terms of the take-home conclusions, I do feel pretty confident suggesting that a diet that's rich in antioxidants from food sources is a damn good idea. Um, I, I really don't see any downside to that. High dose antioxidant supplementation, particularly if we're talking about vitamin C and vitamin E, is generally probably not advisable. Um, and the reason I say that is there's a lack of meaningful benefit when we look at the potential for performance enhancement, reduction in soreness or recovery, anything like that. Very low likelihood of a meaningful benefit, and there is a small risk of some detriment. You know, there. It would be incorrect to say that there's no evidence of blunted hypertrophy in response to high-dose vitamin C supplementation. Um, the, the big caveat there is that it is a small effect and a pretty inconsistent effect. But when you consider the potential pros and the potential cons, I just don't see uh, justification for embarking in a strategy that involves high-dose vitamin C and E supplementation, especially for an individual who doesn't have... Uh, unusually high oxidative stress at baseline. So, um, you know, if, if you hear people talking about how antioxidant should be avoided, uh, for people with hypertrophy related goals, um, that would not be, uh, really justified by the evidence, but you could probably say, Hey, maybe not a good idea to have super high doses of vitamin C and E. What's really interesting though, I get a lot of questions about, you know, people saying, Hey, I heard, uh, antioxidants blunt hypertrophy, but what does that mean for things like beetroot juice, which naturally have a pretty high dose of, of polyphenols and other antioxidant compounds in them? And what the literature appears to indicate for now is that those uh, different plant-based sources that are kind of naturally occurring in fruits and vegetables and the juices extracted from them, they don't seem to behave the same way as a high-dose uh, supplementation regimen with vitamin C or E. So I think if you're getting your antioxidants from fruits, vegetables, or the juices extracted from them, or even, uh, you know, powdered extracts from them, it wouldn't appear that you have anything to worry about there in terms of blunting hypertrophy. Vitamin C and E, the effects of blunting hypertrophy are probably overstated, but there's still just really low potential for benefit from that strategy and a a small possibility of, of, of detriment in terms of hypertrophy.
So if you want to get, uh, like I said, all the details, all the references, uh, head over to that, uh, that link. It's strongerbyscience.com slash antioxidants. You can check out the full article there. May I ask your hot take on something? Yes. Okay, so in general, plant sources of antioxidants seem to be pretty chill. Uh, high dose, concentrated vitamin C and E, maybe not so much. Where would something like a greens powder fall? Uh, I don't think it's quite as popular among fitness people anymore, but I know that, I mean, I know that there's still a ton of people that do this and it used to be super, super popular. There was a brand called, uh, athletic greens, I think that used to sponsor everyone and their brother. Um, and people would say like, Oh, just throw some of this in your like pre and post workout shake. Um, you know, it's, it's the best thing since sliced bread. Where would something like that fall? Um, because it's, it's like a concentrated thing, but like theoretically it's just ground up freeze dried plants. Yeah. I mean, I I remember when those were huge. I, one of the things that drove me nuts about those is that people just completely stopped eating vegetables. (laughs) And I was like, I don't, I don't think that's what you want to do. It is kind of in a gray area. What I would, if, if I had to make a decision, um, based on the evidence I have available now, what I do is I would look at it and say, does this have, 500 or a thousand milligrams of vitamin C. If that were the case, I'd probably stay away from it and just be like, "Eh, it doesn't make any sense. I have no idea what the vitamin C content of those things is. Yeah, I don't either. If it's just giving me a a super concentrated dose of these various uh, phytonutrients that appear to activate NRF2, in that case, I, I probably would be fine with it. But what, what, what I would do based on what we have available, uh, you know, it, it'd be great to have direct research on it, obviously. But I'd say if it's giving me a like mega dose of vitamin C, I'd probably just shy away from it. If the vitamin C is similar to just having like a big serving of vegetables uh, and there's just a bunch of other phytonutrients in there, then I, it's probably fine. All right. Now we had another article uh, in the last few weeks that was about injury. So I'm going to let you take it away with that one. We did. Um, So this article was by Andrew Patton and myself. uh, And to be completely transparent, the division of labor was like 92% Andrew and like 8% me. Um, So he gets that byline to himself. But anyway, this was the culmination of... uh, I don't know, like the better part of four years of intermittent work, um, like very intermittent work. So back in like 2016, give or take, um, I sent out a survey just to kind of get get the lay of the land of like, what do power lifters look like? Um, and I mean, obviously, I know kind of the basics, the basic answers to that question. But, you know, on a more on a broader level, uh, like how strong are people really on average, you know, disregarding my biases from like what I've seen in the specific gyms that I've trained in? Um, how much experience do most powerlifters tend to have? What sorts of training programs are they running? Yada, yada, yada. Just collected a bunch of data about a bunch of different things. One of the things we asked about was injuries. Um, so we were just surveying at one time point, Um, So it was essentially asking about injury history. So have you ever sustained an injury, which pretty much everyone had, uh, but then like what sites had been injured? um, What what was the nature of those injuries, et cetera? So I had done some stuff with that data set. Andrew, who's my buddy, uh, found out that I was sitting on that data, found out that I had injury data. And said, like, hey, do you mind if I tear into this and we can publish some stuff on injuries? So I said, sure. And so 2017, we put out an article just looking at that cross-sectional stuff, um, which was kind of cool, but also wasn't super informative just because of the, um, you know, the great drawbacks of a single time point retrospective analysis like that. Uh, so we decided to get a better data set to look at injuries and powerlifters. We would run a prospective study, meaning essentially we'd recruit people, um, 
and we'd send them surveys every single month to get an idea of, did you get hurt this month? That was our outcome of interest. But then also, how strong are you? Are you getting stronger? What does your training look like? Uh, You know, how frequently do you train? What's your training volume look like? Um, What proportion of your training is like really high intensity stuff? Uh, and, And a bunch of other things. So we ran that for a year. We collected all of the data. Uh, We previously published a couple articles just kind of uh, dipping our toes into the water of, you know, here's what our sample looks like. Here are some very, very basic results. And the final article in that series was recently published, um, which was, you know, finally doing our our full data analysis, like our our full model uh, to really get an idea of at least of the variables we collected of the data we collected, what seems to be most predictive, most indicative of subsequent injury risk. Um, So before I talked about this, I should have pulled up our precise definition of injury, Uh, but it was, it was a pretty strict definition of injury. Uh, Okay. I got it. So we defined uh, an acute injury as any bone fracture, muscle ligament or tendon tear or any joint sprain, dislocation, or separation. Uh, So that was one possible definition. Our second possible definition was any injury that necessitated a trip to a MD or physical therapist, um, not a chiropractor or a massage therapist, because, you know, sometimes people just go and get massages or go to the chiropractor just because, um, or any injury of any variety that necessitated taking time off of training for two weeks or greater. So for example, if you kind of like, I don't know, maybe like tweak a hammy a little bit, um, it's not anything serious. You take your next squat workout a little bit easier and then the workout after that, you're fine, you're good to go. We didn't count that as an injury. Um, whereas if it was something more serious and you had to take a couple weeks off of squatting to, to try to work at rehabbing it, that would be counted as an injury. So it, it was a, it was I would say a, a pretty strict definition of injury that would capture the big stuff that happens to people, um, but not just kind of normal aches and pains that uh, a lifter might experience just in the course of normal training. So uh, we wanted to see, like, of all of the of all of the data we gathered what seems to be the most predictive of injury risk. So we ran the data several different ways. If you want all of the details on that, you can check out the article. Um, But at the end of the day, what seemed to be the most predictive of, of like future injury risk, uh, since this was a prospective study was having prior physical limitations at the start of this year of training. So, People who in their first survey said like, hey, like I'm not injured. I'm not currently taking time off of training, uh, but, you know, maybe I have like this shoulder thing that's bothering me a little bit or uh, like my hamstring feels a little janky, but like, you know, not enough to really make me do anything about my training. Uh, So folks like that who were coming in with some sort of physical limitation were approximately three times as likely to get injured in their subsequent year of training as people who came into the study without uh, any reported prior physical limitations. So the hazard ratio there was right around 3.0 with a 90 with a 95% confidence interval spreading from two to four and a half. Uh, so that's a fairly wide confidence interval, but even the very bottom end of it is two, meaning, you know, rosiest scenario, you're two times as likely to get injured Worst case scenario, closer to four and a half times as likely to get injured. Um, So that was very, very strongly predictive of subsequent injury risk. And that was actually the only thing in our model that was statistically significant using, you know, the the typical standard frequentist definition of a p-value less than or equal to 0.05. So there were a couple other variables that were... Either the hazard ratio was big enough that it's possibly meaningful, even though there was a fairly wide confidence interval, 
or the effect was kind of small, but the p-value was kind of low, but not quite to 0.05. So there were a couple things that kind of fell into that, you know, marginally, possibly meaningful category. One of them was sex. So it seemed like, on average, uh, male lifters were about one and a half times more likely to get injured than female lifters. But we didn't have we didn't have enough female lifters in our sample to make that a super like robust analysis. So the, the hazard ratio was 1.5, meaning 1.5 times more likely to get injured, but the confidence interval was from 0.8 to 2.9. So that, you know, that's all the way from, Oh, maybe female lifters are actually 20% more likely to get injured all the way to male lifters are about three times as likely to get injured. So, you know, it, it kind of seems like with a hazard ratio of 1.5, maybe the male lifters are a little more injury prone, um, but we didn't have enough statistical power and frankly enough female subjects to conclude that with a super high degree of confidence. And then the other thing, um, one of the one of the things we asked them is, like, do you do any cardio or like circuit training, just in any sort of conditioning work? And if so, how many days per week do you do it? Uh, we found that days of conditioning work um, seem to have a protective effect against injury. So this is one where the the effect was reasonably small, but uh, the confidence interval barely contained one. So the p-value is like 0.09, which, you know, isn't technically significant, but but is reasonably close. And that frequentist criteria can suck it anyways. It's dumb. Um, <laughs> so the, the hazard ratio there was 0.92, which essentially means for every one day of conditioning work people did, they were about 8% less likely to get injured. Um, and like I said, fairly tight confidence interval from 0.82 to 1.01. So, you know, seems that we can be reasonably confident that it has a small beneficial effect um, probably not a harmful effect and all and equally likely probably not a large beneficial effect. Um, so it's, it's hard to know really where the causation of that one goes, like w- what direction the causality goes, if there is a causal relationship at all. Um, you know, it, it could just be that folks who do a lot of cardio or, you know, do not even a lot, but say like two or three days of cardio per week aren't as like quote unquote hardcore as folks who are like, ah, cardio's dumb. Who who wants to do cardio ever for any reason? Um, and so, you know, maybe they just aren't aren't as likely to push themselves and like do stupid stuff and get injured because of that reason. Um, so that's one possibility. Another possibility is that it is a kind of like legitimate causal type thing where um, doing some conditioning work has some sort of direct protective effect. Uh, one possible explanation for that is we know from research on athletes that, uh, like non-contact muscle and ligament in- injuries are a lot more common late in games than early in games. One of the reasons for that is just as neuromuscular fatigue sets in, you start to lose some degree of motor control. And so, you know, some maneuver you attempt that uh, your nervous system could coordinate well when you were fresh. Now it doesn't coordinate quite as well when you're a little bit fatigued. Theoretically, possibly the same thing could apply to training as well. So, you know, if you do some cardio, you're in a little bit better shape. Um, You just get less overall neuromuscular fatigue. You can maintain motor control a little bit better throughout a training session and are therefore maybe less likely to get injured for that reason. Um, so yeah, I mean, we didn't have these people all all in one place to take tissue samples and do blood draws and investigate mechanisms. So it's hard to know for sure what explains that finding related to, to cardio potentially being protective, but, uh, you know, seem to be a a reasonably reliable effect uh, within our sample. And then I think the other interesting thing that we found was all of the things we didn't find. So um, we kind of thought that maybe stronger lifters uh, when covariant for sex 
uh, would be maybe more likely to sustain injuries than weaker lifters just because, you know, you're stronger, you're putting more force through the tissues you're training. Um, and so like on a per exposure basis, you may just be more capable of overloading those tissues and possibly causing injuries. We didn't find that to be the case. Uh, we thought maybe older lifters would be a little bit more injury prone than younger lifters. Uh, we didn't find that to be the case. Um, I think Andrew thought that higher training frequencies would be predictive of injury. I kind of thought they wouldn't be because generally higher frequency often means lower volume per session. So I, I kind of thought those two things would balance out. Um, and we didn't find that training frequency was predictive of injury risk. We didn't find that volume was predictive of injury risk. Uh, we didn't find that the proportion of training with heavy loads, which we operationally defined as loads in excess of 85% of one RM. We didn't find that that was predictive of injury risk. Um, so the only thing that that very much seemed for sure predictive of subsequent injury risk was uh, did you have some sort of prior physical limitation being male possibly increases injury risk and doing some cardio possibly slightly decreases injury risk. Literally nothing else seemed to be predictive really to any degree whatsoever. Um, and so, yeah, I, I thought that maybe some of those training variables would be predictive, but they were not at all. All right. Now, Greg, I know you have a little research review planned, but before we get into that, I do want to have a, a little bit of a clarification. So, I believe it was our most recent episode. I talked a little bit about artificial sweeteners and various um, health-related concerns that people often voice about them. And my general assessment of the artificial sweetener literature is that they're pretty much pretty okay. You know, when, when you look at the common concerns people have, there's really not a lot of evidence to justify the generally negative outlook that a lot of people have. So the, the key things that come up that I addressed were things related to gut health, uh, things related to cancer risk, things related to weight gain and appetite. And when you look at the artificial sweetener uh, literature with those particular outcomes in mind, the literature looks pretty good. They, they just seem to be quite neutral when it comes to those those things. Now, after that, I did get a message from one of our listeners, which is always appreciated, by the way. Um, Greg and I won't get defensive. Uh, we, we like to get feedback. And, and every once in a while, once every several years, we will, in fact, be wrong about something. And it's always important to know that. But um, in this case, the listener was like, so you talked about these particular outcomes, but what about stroke and dementia? And I'll be honest, that was a blind spot for me. I, I, I totally forgot that people, <laughs> I, I totally forgot that there was some buzz uh, last year and the year before about whether or not artificial artificial sweeteners might be linked to increased risk of stroke or dementia. So I completely forgot to address one of the notable health concerns a lot of people have. So um, I, I looked back at some of the more recent literature looking at uh, the the links between artificial sweeteners and stroke and dementia. Um, there was a paper by Masavar Rachmani and colleagues, and what they found, uh, this was like kind of a big epidemiology type paper, was that higher self-reported intake of artificially sweetened beverages was associated with increased risk of stroke and some other bad stuff. Now, one of the cool things was uh, that journal is pretty good about publishing uh, commentary and kind of responses to the articles. And there, there was a really excellent piece of commentary, and I'll link it in the show notes here. But um, basically what they found in this study, the headline looks pretty bad. You're like, okay, at face value, a higher risk of stroke. I don't like that. Uh, but one of the people that submitted commentary brought up a really good point, and that was that... Um, what they found in this study was that uh, heavy consumption of artificially sweetened beverages was associated with an increased risk of stroke, but only among obese individuals. When they looked at that association in people that were either normal weight or overweight based on BMI cutoffs, uh, that relationship was not found. And so my takeaway from that and the takeaway uh, from the person who submitted that commentary is that that's probably evidence that at least suggests that there's some reverse causality going on. Basically that in the people who were obese, who 
after becoming obese said, maybe I need to uh, try some strategies for weight reduction. I'm going to switch over to artificially sweetened beverages. In the people who are already obese, that link was observed. In normal weight individuals, it was not. So the idea is that it's it's probably likely that individuals uh, became obese, again, based on the BMI cutoffs, and at that point adopted the use of artificially sweetened beverages, and that that might be one of the things uh, that would be contributing to that apparent link. Um, now, in the commentary, one uh, critique I had was they said, you could interpret that a different way. Maybe it, it's possible that the artificially sweetened beverage consumption actually led to weight gain, and that's what was causing the link in these obese individuals. Um, that theoretically could be true, but when you look at the controlled trials that actually evaluate that particular outcome, you know, do we see people gain weight when we initiate the consumption of artificially sweetened beverages, uh, that concept is not supported. And the the controlled trials on that are a much stronger, uh, much more robust source of evidence than these, uh, you know, kind of speculating about these correlations in uh, observational data. Now, that's not the only paper uh, making these types of links. Uh, there was a paper by Pace and colleagues, and what they found in that paper was uh, higher recent and higher cumulative intake of artificially sweetened soft drinks were associated with increased risk of stroke uh, and dementia as well. Interestingly, they, they found that uh, the, in, uh, the consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages was not associated with stroke or dementia. Um, again, this is one of the papers where there was commentary submitted, and the, whenever I look at a paper, I like to see the commentary, see what other people are saying, and ag again, they kind of took the words right out of my mouth, but in this case, there is, uh, you could make a very strong case that, again, this is confounded by uh, reverse causation. So when, when they looked at this particular data, people who were consuming artificially sweetened beverages showed a higher prevalence of hypertension, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease than people who were regularly taking in high intakes of sugar-sweetened beverages. So again, we see some clues within the data itself indicating that this apparent link between artificially sweetened beverages and these deleterious outcomes, the most likely scenario is that people who were already at increased health risks because they had become obese, uh, they probably switched over and began consuming these artificially sweetened beverages. And that's why we're seeing this link with some of these negative health outcomes. Because at face value, I can't imagine that anyone would argue that switching from an artificially sweetened beverage to a sugar sweetened beverage would reduce your risk of hypertension, diabetes, or cardiovascular disease. I, I just can't imagine somebody seriously making that point. Is there a purported mechanism by which artificially sweetened beverages could cause those things? Uh, the only specific one that I've seen, uh, there are a couple that felt that they seem like a stretch where they're like, all right, we got to make something work here. Um, the, the most common one that you see when it comes to these types of papers is they'll say, well, maybe the artificially sweetened uh, beverages are predisposing people to obesity and having kind of an indirect effect. There, there were a couple others mentioned, but but to me, they seem like a stretch to the extent that I don't even remember them because I saw them on the page and I said, that doesn't make any sense. And I promptly forgot them. So usually what these papers do when, when they link artificially sweetened beverages to some kind of uh, deleterious vascular outcome is they say, hey, here's a thing we observed. Don't know why, but sure is interesting. And they kind of, they kind of leave it at that. I got you. Now, the American Heart Association, uh, they made a statement in 2018, um, and, and I, I can put the link uh, to that in the, um, the show notes as well. But basically, they were talking about this kind of uh, this little cluster of papers that came out with some of these outcomes related to stroke and dementia. And they said uh, in various cardiovascular and metabolic outcomes, um, they said taking together some observational data suggests that there is this association uh, between low calorie or non-caloric sweetened beverages with, you know, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, things of that nature. Um, but again, they noted reverse causality really cannot be ruled out there. And in many cases, uh, th those confounding effects of prior obesity seem to really be pushing some of these effects in the observational literature. When I say pushing, that's, again, speculative. One of the downsides of observational data is 
we we can't really say what's causative, uh, and that works both ways. You can't assert reverse causation any more than you can assert, uh, you know, a typical causative relationship. Um, but but the, the evidence does seem to be at least compatible with the idea that there's some serious reverse causation going on. So um, to the listener that brought this qu- question up to my attention, uh, thank you for doing that. Uh, I definitely should have covered this aspect of the literature the first time around. But for people who do consume artificial sweeteners, uh, the good news is, again, with, with these particular outcomes, when you add stroke and dementia to the risk, again, there just doesn't seem to be a strong case uh, by which you would you would uh, demonize an artificial sweet- sweetener or ascribe any kind of deleterious uh, effects to it. You know, it's this epi stuff is really tricky um, because in many cases it's the best evidence we can really hope to have. Um, but there's a classic figure. Um, <laughs> it, it's gone around. It's made the rounds. Um, I'll, I'll link to it to an article that features it. But uh, it, it's a, a graph, and it, the title is "Everything We Eat Both Causes and Prevents Cancer." And so when you see these observational uh, outcomes with really big sample sizes, and and you see the really low p values. We're we're kind of naturally wired to take those at face value and say, oh God, I got to stop consuming whatever that was. Um, but the 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 figure is just hilarious. So I mean, for for milk, for example, if you if you look at individual studies, there are studies showing that it protects against cancer, and the relative risk is down. It looks like around 0.3, maybe yeah. even a little bit lower. Um, but at the same time, there are studies which, showing... Which means it reduces cancer risk by like 70%. Correct. Yeah. So either a 70% reduction in cancer risk or an over 500% increase in cancer risk uh, with a relative risk over five. So um, if you look at these individual studies within these uh, you know, uh, epidemiological outcomes, it can really lead you astray. You really have to first of all, get a better sense of the broader body of literature. But more importantly, with these types of outcomes, you also have to be able to figure out, like, is there actually a plausible mechanism at play here? So like, like Greg, the first thing you, you thought of was, oh, it's supposed to do that. How? Yeah. And, yeah. and what you'll find in a lot of these really surprising outcomes where you're like, oh my God, why was that associated? Usually you can make a really strong case for reverse causation or some kind of uh, confounding variable really dictating the results. Um, and in many cases, you'll say, okay, well, there's a really good case for reverse causation. In this case, obesity really driving those effects. What is the case for an actual direct causative link between artificial sweeteners and the outcome? In many cases, you come up short. And in those cases, you're like, well, I'm going to be inclined to think reverse causation is at play until I see stronger evidence uh, to to indicate otherwise. Yeah, I, I think like, I think when it comes to, to epi stuff in general, I think a good knee jerk reaction to have is, well, show me the mechanism. Cause I, I think that oftentimes people can on the flip side, maybe be a little bit too dismissive of epidemiological research because it, it has had huge misses in the past. Uh, but like you said, oftentimes epi stuff is the best quality evidence we have and realistically the best quality of evidence we can hope to have. Um, cause I mean, you know, it's not like they're going to recruit a sample of folks who are like 50 years old and tell one of the groups like, Hey, you got to drink three Cokes every day for the next 20 years and tell the other group like, Hey, you have to drink three diet Cokes every day for the next 20 years. Like, that study's just never going to happen. So like, yeah, I mean, oftentimes it is the best evidence you can hope to get. And so like, if you want to ascribe, if you want to attempt to ascribe causation to epidemiological research, the first step toward being able to even attempt to do that is trying to find a plausible mechanism. Um, And you can absolutely accumulate enough evidence that, you can start to become very, very confident. So for example, um, that's, that's like the whole deal with tobacco and the link to lung cancer. Um, it was, it it was resisted for so long because that wasn't something where you could do an RCT on it. Um, especially because if you're proposing, oh, I think smoking cigarettes gives people lung cancer. 
hey, IRB, is it ethical to test that? They're going to say, fuck no. Like, if you think this intervention is going to give 30% of your sample lung cancer, we're not going to sign off on that. Um, But a combination of a lot of mechanistic work to see, you know, how the, the various chemicals could have carcinogenic effects combined with the epidemiological research was eventually able to build an incredibly strong case. Uh, But if it is just one epidemiological study and there's no really strong, plausible mechanism to explain the findings, it is worth being very, very skeptical of. Absolutely. And and I'm, you know, far from a, you know, general epi hater. Um, so I've actually done some work that, that you would consider epidemiology, I guess, uh, you know, big survey based observational data with a sample of, you know, a couple thousand people. And so, uh, as long as you understand the limitations of it and you, uh, contextualize the findings and interpret the findings accordingly, I mean, this is a really useful research tool. So I I agree. I, I have seen people online who the minute they see any kind of observational research design, it's like a knee jerk reaction. They just type, well, correlation ain't causation. And they just completely ignore it. And and that is really not what you want to do. What you want to do is look at it and say, how strong is the correlation? How repeatable is this in other similar studies? And what mechanisms might be at play? Okay, I'm going to complain for maybe like two minutes. Okay. Okay. One of the things that pisses me off to no end, which you just mentioned, <laughs> is fucking when people just mindlessly spout stuff like correlation doesn't equal causation because the thing is that is the the more technically correct expression would be correlation doesn't necessarily imply causation but whatever like even if you're using the more technically correct version there are some people who just throw that out in a lol i am very smart type way while simultaneously making themselves look like complete dumbasses because the person they're responding to wasn't making a fucking causal claim in the first place. Like (laughs) someone will just get on Facebook or Twitter or something and be like, Oh, this is interesting. This study found an association between those two variables. Nowhere in the text of the fucking study. Does anyone try to imply causation? Nowhere in the post where it was being shared. Does anyone try to imply causation? And then like, people just jump in and they're like, Oh, but guess what? Correlation doesn't mean causation. Shut the fuck up. Everybody knows that. Like that, that is not a, that is not a goddamn novel insight. If someone is trying to draw causal inferences from mere correlations, then sure. Hit them with the classic, hit them with the correlation doesn't necessarily imply causation. But if people aren't trying to draw causal inferences from correlations, just don't do it. It's so fucking annoying. Yeah, what what I like to do, um, one of the things I like to do when people just use that phrase way too much is I'll say, you know, a t-test, a comparison of two groups, mathematically is literally equivalent as just saying uh, the outcome of interest was correlated with group assignment, and you'll get the exact same p-value. It's it's mathematically entirely equivalent, and usually that keeps people busy thinking about their entire worldview, and, and, and then they <laughs> stop saying it as much. All right, so you have a research review about sleep restriction, correct? Uh, yeah, kind of. That is, at minimum, my jumping off point. So there's there was a study, uh, it'll be about a week old by the time you're listening to this, but it is currently hot off the presses. Uh, the title of it is The Effect of Sleep Restriction with or Without High-Intensity Interval Exercise on Myofibrillar Protein Synthesis in Healthy Young Men by saner at all. Um, and so this, this was a pretty straightforward study. Um, it used a five night intervention and, uh, there were three groups. So one of the groups, um, slept normally. Um, they didn't have their sleep manipulated, slept about eight hours per night. There was a sleep restriction group where every night for the five nights, they had them sleep just four hours per night, which, would be quite unpleasant. That is, you know, fairly serious sleep restriction. Um, and then a sleep restriction plus exercise group where for the five nights, they also still slept four hours per night, but they also did some high intensity interval exercise, um, during the intervention period. 
and they used um, they used uh, a deuterium based method to look at basically long term muscle protein synthesis. So um, basically, instead of like looking at how quickly like a phenylalanine tracer is taken up immediately post exercise or something like that. Um, you look to see how much of like the, the labeled water is incorporated into muscle proteins over time. So you can basically get an idea of what muscle protein synthesis looked like over a matter of days, weeks, possibly even months. If, you know, if you have enough deuterium for it, um, versus just like a, a super acute muscle protein synthesis study. Um, so they, they were looking at muscle protein synthesis rates over this five night intervention, um, and what they found is that the sleep restriction without exercise group had uh, a small but fairly notable decrease, or I can't necessarily say decrease, but they had um, a meaningfully lower uh, amount of muscle protein synthesis compared to the other two groups. So the fractional synthetic rate in percent per day uh, was about 1.24 plus or minus 0.21%, so about 1.24%. Uh, the non-sleep restricted group, it was about 1.5%, and the sleep restriction plus exercise group was about 1.6%. The uh, the non-sleep restricted group and the sleep restriction plus exercise group had significantly higher rates of muscle protein synthesis than the just sleep restriction group, but the sleep restriction plus exercise group and the normal sleep group were similar to each other in terms of muscle protein uh, fractional synthetic rate. And so just a a quick, quick little note about this study. Um, I would have really, really liked to have seen a fourth group, which was normal sleep plus uh, exercise to see if that would have still been pretty similar to the other two two conditions or if that would have had um, higher rates yet of muscle protein synthesis. Um, So I I think that would have been pretty informative. But at minimum, um, this tells us that one, rates of muscle protein synthesis are likely depressed if you're uh, not sleeping enough. Hard to know if this would apply to say like sleeping six hours per night versus four But if you are considerably sleep deprived, you are probably at a lower just basal rate of muscle protein synthesis. Um, But if you continue exercising and keep in mind, they weren't doing like bodybuilding style training here. It was just high intensity interval training. Um, That was enough to maintain muscle protein synthesis rates similar to normal sleep. So that in and of itself, I think is kind of cool. Um, but I, I kind of wanted to use this as a jumping off point to make a point that I think we've talked about on the podcast before, but if we did, it was probably at minimum six months and and probably close to a year ago. Um, which is that I think, I think when it comes to like muscle protein synthesis and just building muscle in general, um, people overlook just how important exercise is. Uh, and so, and I don't know, I could have a completely misconstrued view on this. Um, but I I occasionally see people asking, so I I've come across this question probably four or five times in the past month, um, of people saying like, Hey, so like I'm, about to take some time off of training, like I'm going on vacation or uh, I'm, I'm about to have to travel for a job and the place I'm going doesn't have a gym. Um, so if I eat enough protein, how like will that help me keep building muscle or like, you know, is that going if I eat a ton of protein, will that help me maintain all of the muscle I built through training stuff like that? Uh, and so like in general, like higher protein intakes are generally better. And I don't think anyone's contesting that, but the degree to which essentially anything matters compared to exercise, exposing your muscles to work and tension, um, everything else with the exception of steroids, uh, just absolutely pales in comparison. So, um, 
I think this study is a decent example of this very, very serious sleep deprivation. Um, you know, if you add some exercise on top of that, still probably not ideal for long-term training outcomes, but was at least capable of putting folks on a relatively even playing ground to folks who were actually sleeping enough. Um, the study that I think is, is the most interesting to kind of elucidate this is, uh, one of the people who's on my thesis committee, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Eric Hansen. Um, he did a study or, or he was part of a study that was looking at the effects of androgen deprivation therapy on muscle protein synthesis. So, uh, ADT, um, it probably has some other clinical uses, but I know it's primarily used in, uh, in men with prostate cancer because essentially like testosterone and DHT, um, accelerate tumor growth in, in people who have prostate cancer. So one of the primary treatments is you take drugs that essentially suppress your testosterone levels to zero. So not just like kind of garden variety low T, but like just straight up no testosterone whatsoever. Um, and so they found that, I mean, they didn't find that this is something that's super well known. ADT depresses just basal rates of muscle protein synthesis. If you're a dude and you have no testosterone in your body, uh, your muscles don't kind of hum along and synthesize protein at the same rate, which shouldn't be too shocking to anyone. But they found that if you take men on androgen deprivation therapy and have them perform resistance training and compare them to a group of, uh, of men with normal testosterone levels who undergo resistance training, muscle protein synthesis is actually virtually identical. Um, I, think, I think it was still like nominally lower in the people who, had, who were on ADT, um, but, you know, it, it was like a pretty big baseline difference, of just like resting muscle protein synthesis. And then post-workout, you know, the ADT group, it was like 95% the fractional synthetic rate of men with normal testosterone. Um, so, like, dude, exercise, resistance training, it's it's super clutch. Like, it, it does... It, like, all of the other stuff we talk about absolutely matters, but, like, just getting in the gym and doing something, uh, some sort of, of physical exercise and ideally weight training has such a larger effect on muscle metabolism and like long-term effects on hypertrophy so much greater than, than literally anything else. Um, another, so I mentioned people who are like obsessing about protein intake versus asking like, oh, hey, I'm traveling for work. What's like some body weight training I can do when I'm going to be out of the gym? Like like that, that's the sort of question you should be asking because like eating, eating protein when you're not training will probably help you maintain more muscle mass, but s still trying to find some way to do some sort of training is going to have uh, an enormously larger effect. Um, and so, yeah, I think one of, the other like illuminating things to look at is if you look at protein research and you look at uh, studies comparing higher versus lower protein intakes, um, something like two thirds of them don't find a statistically significant effect. If you pull them all together in, in a meta analysis, you do find like surprise, surprise, eating more protein does help people um either like maintain more muscle when they're aging or build more muscle when they're undergoing resistance training, but the effect is relatively modest. And then you compare that to studies that compare uh, a non-exercising control group to a group of people undergoing resistance training. And I mean, like it's at that point, it's, it's not even worth comparing. Um, like obviously you get tremendously better, muscle growth, hypertrophy outcomes with resistance training than not resistance training. Um, so yeah, I mean like a lot of shit matters, but just simply doing something, uh, physical is going to have a way, way bigger impact than, than literally anything else you can do. And so I'm, I'm sure that I'm preaching to the choir here. Um, I doubt that there are many people who listen to our podcast who are like, 
hmm, I'm trying to pick up tips from these guys about how to exercise less and still get decent results. Um, so yeah, I'm sure you, you guys are already sold on this, but, uh, I don't know. I think it's just worth keeping in mind. Um, of all of the things that matter or don't matter, I I think it's worth kind of, I think it's worth having a rough hierarchy in mind of what matters more than other things. And to what degree do things matter more or less than other things that you could do? Um, and at, at the foundation of that pyramid, like the most important thing, bar none, is how much exercise you're doing and the type of exercise you're doing. Everything else, I don't want to say is just the cherry on top because it can have actual meaningful effects. Um, but exercise is is a, a million percent in the driver's seat. I'm just going to say it. I, I'm... I think this is a personal attack because you know that I've been out of town for the last like seven days. You know that I haven't been training and I feel like it's not a coincidence that this is the day of all days that you get on your soapbox and say, hey, when you're traveling, make sure you do something. Why are you so worried about protein? I did not know you hadn't been training. What do you think I was? What did you think I was doing? I don't know. You could do like fucking push ups in your hotel room. I was in the middle of nowhere in Vermont. There were no gyms around it, and I hate body weight exercise. There was no floor? There was a floor. There were several floors. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, so you're you're sh- clearly shaming me for not training last week, and that's fine. But I'm going to get back into it, and I'm going to be bigger and better than ever. Okay, so uh, on to some Q&As, right? Yes, sir. All right, first one looks like it's for me. All right, so uh, question here from... The Netherlands loves you. What's up with recent news about antibacterial mouthwash having deleterious effects on blood pressure via oral bacteria and nitrate, nitrite, nitric oxide, etc.? Will throwing out my Listerine result in reduced blood pressure and, more importantly, sick pumps? Yeah, so I didn't know that there was recent news about it, um, but this is something that has been kind of known in the nitrate literature for for a few years now. Um, So absolutely, there's an effect here. If you're using like a really strong antibacterial mouthwash, it will uh, completely knock out any benefit that you would hope to receive from a nitrate supplement. Um, So when we consume nitrate, um, what happens is bacteria in our mouth, our oral cavity, reduce that nitrate to nitrite. Not all of it, but some of it. And then what happens is, you know, we it goes down into the stomach, we absorb it into the blood, but there actually is kind of an active cyclical loop by which nitrate in the blood will get taken back up uh, by the salivary glands, and we can do even more conversion of some of that blood nitrate down to nitrite, and then back through uh, the the GI tract. And there's this kind of cyclical loop, but the really key point here is without those bacteria in the oral cavity, that conversion from nitrate to nitrite cannot happen. And so, uh, yeah, if you're thinking, oh, I'm going to go get a really nice beetroot product or some kind of nitrate product and get some really nice pumps, and you're using a strong antibacterial mouthwash that's killing all those bacteria, um, you are not going to get what you were hoping for. And so that's a really important consideration. Um, Now, uh, the the question about blood pressure, absolutely. There there are some studies looking at large uh, groups of people, and they do find that users of, you know, antibacterial mouthwash do tend to have slightly higher blood pressure which is fascinating. Now, the actual magnitude of that effect is very, very small. So you're not going from, you know, great blood pressure to hypertension because you decided to use some mouthwash. However, it it is one of those things that the statistically significant relationship supports what we would intuitively expect, which is that that conversion of whatever dietary nitrate you're getting in to nitrite Uh, which is a critical step. If you're trying to make nitric oxide from the nitrate you're taking in, you can't circumvent that step. If you don't have those oral bacteria, that step's not happening. And that's why we do see at at the big like population level, users of strong antibacterial mouthwashes tend to have blood pressure that's like a couple points higher. So it's not a huge deal. But if you're trying to use some kind of nitrate-based 
uh, supplement or if you're eating more nitrate intentionally to try to enhance your performance, you are not going to get those benefits if you're using uh, an antibacterial mouthwash regularly. So very important to keep in mind. And if you look at the methods of any paper that that, that does uh, you know any kind of beetroot or nitrate supplementation, the majority of them will will put in the methods. You know, we we told everybody don't use any mouthwash during the study. Okay, uh, Greg, we got a question for you. Uh, this one is from Max. What is your stance on the conjugate method for raw lifters? Would you recommend it in the long term, and how would you adjust it for raw lifters if any adjustments are necessary? Yeah, so um, there is both a very straightforward answer to this question and a moderately straightforward answer to this question, and it ultimately comes down to how one defines uh, the conjugate method. So one, so the the conjugate method essentially just means, in a nutshell, um, a form of programming or periodization where you're training multiple physical qualities at once. So that's in, uh, that's in opposition to something like classical linear periodization where, you know, you might only train for hypertrophy and then only train for strength and then only train for power, et cetera. Um, so like if, if that's the definition you're using, then conjugate periodization is essentially like I think it originated with like Russian periodization folks. Uh, Louis Simmons popularized it in the West, but it is essentially synonymous with concurrent periodization, um, which is literally the exact same concept. And uh, yeah, I mean, you can, you can do that. Um, (laughs) So like DUP would be an example of concurrent periodization or conjugate periodization. So, you know, you're training, uh, you have a session that's focused on power. You have a session that's focused on strength. You have a session focused on hypertrophy all in the same week. Um, you know, lots of people use a DUP type setup long-term, uh, and, and that's completely fine. So if that's the definition of conjugate you're using, where, you know, you're kind of going with a textbook definition where it's, essentially synonymous with concurrent periodization, then, uh, yeah, sure. There's, there's nothing at all wrong with that. So then the second possible definition you could be using is the conjugate method basically just means everything Louis Simmons ever said about powerlifting. Um, and I kind of think that's what most people mean when they talk about the conjugate method. So, uh, let's talk about West side for raw lifters. So I I think that um, I think that a lot of people have unnecessarily just completely dismissed West Side. Um, And I'm I'm not necessarily trying to, like, stand for Louis Simmons or anything like that. But uh, I think I mean, I think it can still work. That's what got me into powerlifting in the first place. Like I trained kind of orthodox West Side uh, did some, did some things that were probably somewhat ill, ill advised. Uh, but like I made gains, I got stronger. I found other things that worked for me better, uh, down the line, but I mean, it was still, it was still good. Uh, and most of the people I trained with, at least at one point, kind of in that time early in my career, we were all raw lifters. We were all doing kind of like orthodox West side stuff. We all had good results. Um, so yeah, I mean, like it, it works. Uh, the question is just like, could one make it work better for raw lifters? Um, and you know, are there other ways that, that may work just as well, if not better? Um, but so I'm just going to address that first one. Basically, how, how would I adopt or adapt kind of like classical West side programming for raw lifters? Um, so I, I think the first thing that I would do is uh, Louis Simmons recommends box squats kind of for all people in all circumstances. I don't really see much utility uh, from from box squats for raw lifters. It's not that it's necessarily a bad exercise, but one of the big benefits of box squats, uh, if you're an equipped power lifter, is you can kind of like mimic to some degree the stopping power of 
uh, a stiff squat suit and stiff briefs. Um, you obviously don't have that if you're squatting brawl. So I, I think you're going to get much, much better carryover from either just drastically reducing the box squats you do or, or just not doing box squats. Um, so that's probably where I would start. Uh, next thing that I would probably change but not eliminate completely if I went back and did West Side again is um, I actually quite liked using accommodating resistance and I own a set of chains, but someone else currently has that set in their possession um, and I need to go get those back. I'm not crazy about bands and I think that's more of a personal thing, but I love chains. I think they're absolutely fantastic. Um, one, they're just cool. And two, um, I don't know. I, I think I think they're kind of a happy medium of letting you feel heavier weight than maybe you can move through a full range of motion, unloading some of the joints a little bit at long ranges of motion where possibly they're creaky or at least mine are. Um, while it's still feeling very, very comparable to just straight weight, whereas that's the thing I think I lose with bands. Uh, but I, I do like accommodating resistance in, in general, and especially chains. Um, but I think one of the bigger things I would recommend is if you do use accommodating resistance for like West Side style dynamic effort work, I'd recommend going not quite as crazy with the accommodating resistance. So, oh man, I forget Louis's recommendations right off the top of my head for like what percentage of total resistance should come from chains or bands, but it was something reasonably high. I think he generally recommended like 40 or 50% of the total uh, resistance coming from chains or bands. And I would say for a raw lifter, just because the strength curve isn't that extreme. So, you know, with, um, with, with equipped lifting, like the gear is giving you more help at the bottom than it is at the top. And so you have like a pretty extreme wonky strength curve, um, in like a strength curve for a raw bench press or a raw squat isn't perfectly flat by any means, but it's certainly a lot flatter than equipped. Um, so I, I think like, I don't necessarily think you're going to get better results from using accommodating resistance, but I don't think it's going to hurt your results. Uh, and I think that for raw lifting, it would make sense for maybe something closer to like 20, 25% of the total resistance coming from, uh, chains and bands rather than like 40, 50%. Next thing I would probably address would be lift selection. So, you know, not just eschewing box squats, but, uh, the, the lifts you cycle through for max effort day. Um, you know, I don't think you should be doing a bunch of, uh, a bunch of high board press or anything like that. Um, Louis absolutely loves, or at least at the time that I was following West side, absolutely loved good mornings. Um, I kind of think you should just stick to deadlifts and squats and, and variations thereof. Um, so yeah, wouldn't really worry about lockout work too much. Um, certainly, you know, if you do board press, stick to like one and two board, like I don't think raw lifters really need to worry about messing around with three and four board press. Uh, I think you're going to get more utility out of squat variations, uh, and deadlift variations than just doing a crap ton of good mornings. Uh, and I will say, Louie has been an exceptional powerlifting coach and he's produced a ton of huge squatters and huge benchers. And like there have been some big deadlifters who've come through West Side, but they by and large haven't attained quite as much success in the deadlift as they have the other two lifts. Do with that what you will. Um, I do think and, and I'm just going about going off of what I remember from West Side like 2012 and prior. I don't know, maybe Louis has his guys deadlifting all the time now. At least back then, they weren't deadlifting much. Um, but yeah, deadlifts, they're good. Uh, deadlifts will probably carry over to deadlifts a little bit better than good mornings will. Uh, and then the last thing that I would address would be uh, accessory lift selection. So again, back when I was doing West Side stuff, Louis was all about, you know, train posterior chain all the time. Uh, make sure you do your... Uh, make sure you do reverse hypers 47 times a week. And for upper body stuff, make sure you're hammering the triceps, 
Who cares about the pecs? Just do a shit ton of tricep work. Uh, for raw lifters, you know, you're using your pecs a lot in the bench press um, for your for your west side accessories. Um, you know, triceps certainly keep training them, but don't neglect the chest as well. Uh, and for lower body stuff, having a strong posterior chain, very cool, very awesome, would highly recommend it. But also uh, quad strength plays a bigger role in the raw squat than it does the equip squat. So don't eschew quad work in your accessories as well. Uh, but yeah, the, the overall structure of like West Side style conjugate periodization, I think is solid and can absolutely work. But uh, I wouldn't necessarily port the system that Louie developed for equip lifting one to one uh, to raw lifting. So just kind of recap, get rid of the box squats, um, go a little bit lighter on chain weight and band tension like you can still use it. But, you know, probably 20, 25 percent of the total resistance for dynamic effort days. Um, just use use lift selection for max effort days that is more appropriate to raw lifting. So longer ranges of motion, uh, deadlifts instead of a bunch of good mornings. I feel like that should be pretty straightforward. Uh, and then for accessories, you know, still train the triceps and posterior chain, but don't neglect the quads. Don't neglect the pecs. All right. Next question is by whoever, and it is for Eric. So Eric, whoever asks, I mix creatine night before any drawbacks to this. So I'm assuming this means they basically mix their creatine, leave it, and then they consume it the next get, the next day. Is that what it sounds like? I think so. Yeah. So there's a paper by uh, Yager in 2011, and it talks a little bit about the stability of creatine. Now, creatine is extremely stable uh, when it's stored in dry conditions at room temperature. Um, however, creatine is not very stable uh, after it's mixed into uh, a liquid solution. Now, not all liquids are the same in terms of the rate of creatine breakdown. So the creatine that you put in a solution is going to break down faster if the pH is low or if the temperature is high. So like the worst thing you could do is put it in a really hot acidic beverage and then leave it for several hours and consume it later. So um, ideally, you'd want to mix your creatine close to the time you take it, but it's not a huge deal. So th they've got a really nice uh, figure in that paper by by Yager. And what they do is they, they kind of chart the amount of creatine breakdown over several hours, uh, mixing the creatine into beverages of varying pH levels. Now, over 72 hours, if you've got a your creatine mixed into a beverage that's got a pH between 6.5 and 7.5, um, even 72 hours later, you're still going to retain about 98% of that creatine. So that magnitude of creatine breakdown, as far as I'm concerned, is essentially um, negligible. Uh, but if you're mixing it into an acidic beverage, uh, you could see as much as uh, you know 20% of your creatine breakdown over a 72 hour period. What you also notice when you look at these different time courses is, you know, regardless of the pH up to about eight hours, the, the relative amount of breakdown, you only see about three or 4%, uh, really actually more like two or 3% of breakdown in those first eight hours. After that, the acidic beverages between eight and 24 hours, that's where you start to see a little bit more of the breakdown occurring. Uh, and then it just continues from there. So, um, you know, within eight hours, it's really not a big deal. Um, once you get beyond that, you probably want to start thinking about at what temperature are you storing it and what is the acidity of the beverage. The best case scenario is just mix it right before you have it. Um, but, you know, anything within that 8, 12, 24 hour window should generally be fine as long as it's not in a super acidic beverage. Um, now there is, uh, a lot of times whenever people ask about timing of creatine, I just throw this in anyway. Um, you know, there's the timing of when you mix it relative to when you drink it. Another common question that I might as well answer while we're here is what's the best time of day to take creatine? I, I get asked that a lot. There are a couple, uh, a couple studies indicating that it might be slightly, slightly 
slightly more beneficial to consume it after a workout uh, compared to any other time of day, like before the workout or just totally separated from the workout. Um, generally speaking, though, the timing of creatine is is really not a super essential thing to worry about. If you were, you know, really focused on getting that last half of a percent out of your creatine supplementation, you might consider moving it to the immediate post-workout period. But whether you're taking it in the morning, the night, pre-workout, post-workout, creatine tends to absorb into the muscles very, very well. Uh, and it, the, the timing of your creatine relative to the workout, really not that big of a deal. Okay, that does it for the Q&A segment uh, of, of today's episode. Uh, the next segment is actually a brand new segment. Um, we are calling it On the Rise. And, and in this upcoming segment, what we're doing is basically highlighting a uh, someone in the fitness space who's making really good content but maybe doesn't have a particularly huge following or deserves to have a bigger following than they have you know basically someone making good content that we think uh, if you're a listener of our podcast you might have an interest in checking them out um and and greg if people want to nominate someone for this how do they go about doing that uh, so I set up a like Google form uh, and you can find that at tiny.cc slash creators. That is again, tiny.cc slash creators. Awesome. So uh, for the first ever on the rise segment, who is on the rise, Greg? Okay. Uh, before I reveal that first, I need to give a big meaty disclaimer, which I will probably give before this segment every single time we record it. Absolutely. Um, in all circumstances, if we, if we promote someone on this segment, that is not a carte blanche. Uh, that is not us saying we agree with everything this person has ever said. So please, please don't message us and say, Hey, four months ago, this person said one thing that disagrees with this thing that you said two years ago. You want to fight about it? No, I absolutely don't. Uh, you know, not necessarily say saying we agree with everything that they've ever said about anything fitness related, just that we checked out some of their content, seemed to be generally good, or we found something that they were talking about that was quite good. Not a blank check. Uh, number two... If, and for, for this one we're starting with, I would be very disappointed. Uh, if it turns out that any of the people we end up promoting turn out one day to be utter and complete shitheads, we accept no responsibility for that. <laughs> um, we, it's not like we have a massive interview thorough vetting process. Um, so yeah, disclaimer, get that out of the way. Yeah, we're not making appointments to the Supreme Court here. Uh, this is just saying, hey, here's somebody doing good stuff. And uh, yeah, if we were to make a segment where we did just write that blank check and say, I support everything this person has ever done or will ever do, that list, that would probably be like a two episode segment before we retire <laughs> it. And probably by the time we're all done in the fitness world, that we'd probably regret at least one of them. Correct. Uh, so anyway, with that disclaimer out of the way, I actually, for our first time ever doing this segment, I would like to start with a little bit of nepotism uh, and talk about my friend, Megan Calloway. So I met Megan this past year um, at the Evolve Canadian Strength Symposium up in beautiful Edmonton, Canada. Um, so Megan's great. We hung out the whole weekend. Um, if you are interested at all in pull-ups, she is the person to check out. Um, she does talk about other things, but pull-ups are her bread and butter. She has thought about and obsessed over pull-ups more than anyone probably ever, probably more than is healthy. Um, but because she is so hyper specialized in that one thing, if you want to know anything about pull-ups, she's the person to ask. If you want to get better at pull-ups, she is the person to go to. Um, she has a, I guess, ebook guide uh, called The Ultimate Pull-Up Program. It's really good. I've read it. The last time it was on sale, I actually um, shared it on my Instagram story. 
there were a fair amount of people in our audience uh, who got it and then like made a point of messaging me back a couple weeks later saying like, hey, I picked up uh, Ultimate Pull Up Program. It was super good. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, so that was that was good to hear. Uh, but yeah, Megan's great. She's a fun person to be around. Absolutely fantastic. Knows pull-ups inside and out. Um, so if you'd like to check out Megan and her stuff, uh, Instagram is by far the platform that she is the most active on. She is at Megan Calloway, which is M-E-G-H-A-N-C-A-L-L-A-W-A-Y. Uh, and we will put that in the show notes. Um, but yeah, she's great. And like I said, if if pull-ups are your jam, um, her work is the work to check out. Yeah, and I, I've met Megan as well. She's really cool. She does good work. And now her responsibility, you know, being the inaugural person showcased in the segment is to never say anything wrong for the rest of her career. <laughs> Uh, because Greg and I do not want to hear about it. So Megan, the pressure is on. Don't make any mistakes ever again. Sound good? Perfect. Well, that implies she ever made a mistake. That that That's not, I don't necessarily know that. But starting now, no mistakes. Okay, um, to close out this, uh, the episode, to play us out today, um, people have been clamoring. They keep saying, Eric, we want more of your cooking tips. And they're sick of Greg taking it up. And so everybody relax. You're going to get more of Eric's cooking tips uh, at the end, but Greg saw it in the outline. He got really upset that I was giving cooking tips. So he wanted to give one. So just kind of tune this out. When you hear my voice come back on, you'll know the real cooking tips are ready, but I'm going to let Greg go first. Yeah. So, uh, (laughs) so this is more just like a general recommendation than, uh, you know, specifically recommending like a dish or anything like that. But uh, I think mushrooms are pretty slept on. Mushrooms are fantastic. And I think like when I see people talking about diet stuff online, um, the, the, the great fungi of the world seem to be sorely left out. Uh, people talk about, you know, what uh, what meat they're eating, what protein sources they're using, what they're using for starches, their vegetables. Um, and when when I see people make lists of like, hey, here's like the vegetables and stuff that you should eat when you're cutting. Mushrooms aren't a vegetable, so maybe they're not putting it on the list as a technicality, but mushrooms are definitely something you should keep in mind. So they, uh, again, are not vegetables. They're not plants. They are um, fungi, but they have kind of a a similar macronutrient profile and, and some of the general benefits that one would get from eating plants. So they're low in calories, they're high in fiber, they're very satiating. Um, And this is coming from me. I don't love vegetables, but I love mushrooms. Uh, And, you know, if you're someone who is in a similar boat, maybe it's worth giving mushrooms more of a shot. So mushrooms are very, very cool, not only because they're good for you and, and high in fiber and I think personally quite delicious, If you are, say, maybe not an incredibly confident home cook, mushrooms are quite possibly the easiest food ever to cook. So if you're cooking, say, vegetables, uh, if you undercook them, like maybe they're still a little crunchier than you want or whatever, but they're generally fine, then they're kind of perfect for a very brief moment, and then you overcook them and they're just mushy and kind of sad and not good. You can very clearly over and undercook vegetables. Uh, Meat, especially, is the same way. So you can undercook meat. It's still raw. You get sick. You die. It's no fun. And you can also absolutely overcook meat. It dries out. uh, The texture shit doesn't taste as good anymore. Um, Mushrooms, because of uh, their, their protein structure... God, I should have looked this up. I believe it's called chitin. Um... Just the way that that traps moisture and helps maintain uh, the structure of the mushroom better than, say, cellulose does in plants, it it becomes incredibly difficult to mess up cooking mushrooms. So, like, 
you can undercook them and they'll still just kind of have the the mouth feel of raw mushrooms which i personally don't find super pleasant but if you do want to make cooked mushrooms it's so easy you have so much leeway where you know you cook them it seems like most of the waters come out you try one ah, it seems mostly done maybe they could go a little bit more if you just like leave the pan on this on the stove and forget about them or say like you're boiling mushrooms and you leave them in the water for a little bit longer and let's say you forget about it for 30 minutes like a, a completely unconscionable amount of time when you come back they'll still be just fine mushrooms. Whereas if that was any other food, it would be completely ruined by that point. Uh, unless it was like a, a meat dish that you were trying to braise. But like for the most part, there's a there's a reasonably small, acceptable range of like cooking temperatures and times. Mushrooms just completely blow that out of the water. Very, very hard to mess up cooking mushrooms. The other cool thing about mushrooms, uh, at least for me, is they... So I love meat. I love it so much. Uh, And I feel a little, I feel a non-negligible amount of guilt about how much meat I eat. Um, But it's not just for the protein. Like I, I just really, really love meat. One of the cool things, at least for me, for mushrooms, is they help scratch a similar itch. um, Because unlike, say, vegetables... I can't think right off the top of my head of any vegetable that gives me the same sort of bite that meat does. And the bite you get from a cooked mushroom is not identical to meat, but it, it's it has a somewhat similar toothsomeness that you're not necessarily going to get from cooked vegetables. Um, and it's also quite savory. So mushrooms, uh, most varieties of mushrooms are high in free glutamates, which is what produces the umami since the, the umami taste or the savory taste. Um, same thing that makes like stuff flavored with MSG taste delicious. Um, and also there's high levels of free glutamate in meats. So it, it scratches a similar itch that way as well. Um, and man, you can make some really, really, really good mushrooms that within your diet can function essentially the same way you would use vegetables um super simply and they're they're gonna scratch that savory itch if that's you know something you want in in non-meat products um so you can sear the shit out of mushrooms um it'll develop like it'll it'll caramelize i believe it undergoes a maillard reaction like i think that there's enough like chitinous protein that that you can actually get some maillard browning as well um just throw some salt and pepper on it um possibly even some soy sauce goes super well with it very salty very savory insane depth of flavor you can eat it on its own you can use it as like a garnish for other dishes or you can throw it in soups um ton of flavor very good for you very easy to cook um and and just gives you a different flavor flavor sensation than you're going to get from from vegetables that you would otherwise be eating for you know, with a similar slot in your diet. Um, so yeah, you can do a lot of stuff with mushrooms. I just want to remind you guys that mushrooms exist because I, like I said, think they are super slept on and that most people should probably be eating more mushrooms. Okay, if you tuned out during Greg's jealousy-fueled uh, mushroom propaganda, it's time to listen up because it's time for Eric's cooking tips. Now, If you've listened to my cooking tips in the past, you know that my whole thing is I like cooking things that are inexpensive, extremely easy, and require literally no time or effort. And so that's exactly what you're going to get here. Um, I, Whenever I start trying to kind of get a little bit leaner, whenever I start a cut or a mini cut and I decide I want to lose some body fat, one of the things I've always done is really ramped up the amount of spicy food I eat. It was just kind of something that... I naturally found whenever I had a super spicy meal, I tended to be very uh, satiated after the meal. I didn't tend to uh, gravitate towards snacking in the post-meal period. And honestly, if you've been keeping tabs on the capsaicinoid literature in recent months, there's just nothing to dislike about capsaicinoids right now. Um, You look at the literature, there's some evidence that capsaicinoids, and when I say capsaicinoids, by the way, we're talking about the 
capsaicin related compounds that make hot peppers hot and it's what gives them their their spicy uh, flavor and that that heat sensation so capsaicinoids there's there's literature indicating that you know uh capsaicin or capsiate uh, which is a capsaicinoid capsiate supplements uh, have been shown to increase reps to fatigue um, there's research showing uh, multiple capsaicinoids to uh, have a thermogenic effect, to potentially have a um, an effect by which they reduce uh, hunger or desire to eat after a meal. And so across the board, there's there's plenty of reasons to love spicy food and to love capsaicinoids. And most importantly, spicy food tastes awesome. So what I'm going to give you here is basically the meal that I eat for essentially every meal currently. And uh, so what, what it is, it's my spicy chicken recipe. Here's what you do. You make your chicken in the crock pot. That's going to last you the week or, you know, at least several days. Uh, put all your chicken in the crock pot. You put it in with a, a jar of salsa. And then I usually just fill it up with water to the point where the chicken is submerged in the crock pot. You cook that, you're good to go for, you know, the next several days. And when you're actually going to have the meal, what you do is you take out a bowl. You put in a frozen chopped pepper and onion mix. So like bell peppers and some onion chopped up. Buy it frozen at the grocery. It's already pre-washed, pre-chopped, ready to go. I also put in frozen riced cauliflower as well. So that's my vegetable mix. Put it in the microwave for a couple minutes. Just get it to like cool temperature. You don't need to, you don't need it to be hot like you're about to eat it. You just want to basically get it to a similar temperature as the chicken that's been in your refrigerator for a day or two. Then you put the chicken in, you mix it all together, you get that, you know, get it heated up in the microwave to the temperature you want to eat it at. Then you pull that out, and here's where the magic happens. What you're going to do, you're going to put on some salt, some black pepper, some cayenne pepper, and some chili pepper, okay? And then on top of that, you're going to put some sriracha hot sauce. Now, this meal uh, has incredibly good macros, You could get as lean as you would ever possibly want to get eating meals like this. It's basically a bunch of fiber, some micronutrients, and some chicken. Um, Tastes awesome. I will admit, the way that I put the spices on in the sauce, um, it's more of a challenge than a meal. Uh, I break a sweat because I go really heavy with the spices, but it's just an awesome, easy meal, super quick to make, super cheap. I mean, this is a a foundational meal that I usually eat whenever I start cutting. Super cheap, super easy. And if you're like me and you hate spending time cooking, it is awesome. Greg, what do you think of that meal? Sounds okay. I'll I'll make it for you sometime. You've you've made me a couple meals in the past. I feel like I owe you one. Got some really good sauteed mushrooms in the fridge. Okay. You want to try some? I, I definitely do. I haven't eaten in like many, many hours. So I'm going to go try these mushrooms and see if I can verify all the propaganda that Greg shared a few minutes ago. Um, That does it for this episode. As always, thank you for listening. We'll have another one up in two weeks. Thanks for listening to the Stronger by Science podcast. Now, Greg and I are not experts in medicine or health or really anything else for that matter. So before you make any changes to your diet and exercise habits, make sure you check with a doctor or another healthcare professional. If you enjoyed this podcast and you'd like to support it, visit strongerbyscience.com to check out the products and services that we offer. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.